All right, if you have a Bible this morning, I hope that you do. We're in the prophecy of Hosea again. Hosea chapter 11, growing up, you know, older brother, 17 months older than I am. Uh, but he was always far bigger than I was until about my junior year of high school. And so Nate, my older brother, just beat me at everything, every contest, every competition, um, until I was about 17 or 18. And then the, the playing field got a little more level. But the one thing I could never beat him in, never best him in, was the hold your breath under the water challenge. You know, when your kids, at least for us growing up in the 80s, we didn't have all the distractions of today, so we're like, hey, you know, what should we do? And it's like, we should just, you know, place ourselves under the water for as long as possible and see how that works out. And so we would do that. He'd be like, I bet I can hold my breath longer than you. And I'm like, I bet you can too, but let's do it anyway. And so he would go underneath the water. I'd go under, I have apparently almost zero lung capacity. About 17 or 18 seconds later, my head would emerge from the water. He'd still be underneath. I'm not even kidding. He could hold his breath up to four minutes. Like this guy was like a Navy SEAL at 13. And, uh, and so I would, uh, as time went by, we're there in the pool. I got wise. And so when I would come up and he would still be underneath the water holding his breath, eyes closed, I would just go back down. <laughs> pretend like I had never come up in the first place. I was unregenerate, by the way, at that point. And, uh, and so I'd go back down and then, I don't know, 15 seconds later, I'd burst up again. My lungs felt like they were starving for air and he's still underneath the water. I'd go back down. And then as years went by, I realized after the competitions had ceased that he was probably doing the same thing I was doing and I just didn't realize it because my eyes were closed. But I remember after like, you know, you're underneath the water, whether it was in a competition against him or whether I'm swimming, just having fun, whatever it is. And I've been under the water for a while. Um, the lungs are, feel like they're bursting. I'm desperate for oxygen. And finally, after however long it had been, my head would break the surface and I would gulp in these refreshing amounts of air. And that is, I was taken back to that scenario. And that is the feeling I felt this week as I was reading Hosea 11. Because for weeks, and we've almost joked about it, but week in, week out, has compared his people, Israel, in the 8th century, 2,700 years ago, and he has compared us today to way of this prospect. He says, I've loved you, I have wed you, I have betrothed you to myself, I am devoted to you, and yet you've continued to run after other idols, other lovers of your soul, and week upon week, chapter upon chapter, he's just been calling out our sin and our waywardness and our unfaithfulness and calling us to repentance. And there's just been this, this really loving, a relentless pursuit of God upon our lives to call us back to himself. But it's been dark and it's been heavy. And perhaps you felt this as we've gone through chapter six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and all of a sudden, there is an enormous shift. Our head literally breaks the water, and we breathe in the radical nature of grace this week in chapter 11. And watch what God says to us in verse 1 of chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt... I called my son. So this is poetry once again. It's most likely not really talking about Israel's adolescence, so to speak, as a young nation, but it's poetically saying from very inception of this nation, of this people, I have been sent to Abraham covenantally, I have loved them. We look back at Abraham and we're like, well, was he a lot better than the nation of Israel that we're seeing now in the eighth century? Abraham, 1200 years before, was he really that much more pristine, that much more robust in faith? No. When God came to him, he was a pagan and he was unfaithful. And then the Lord continues to preserve his people. And he says, out of Egypt, I called you. And they, these people were not really faithful either. They weren't that devoted either. We go back to that moment and we see a people who have compromised, a people who have become culturally acclimated to the gods of Egypt around them for the most part. And yet God faithfully comes to his people and says, I love you and I have favored you and I have graced you and you are my people and I will be faithful to you in the absence of your faithfulness to me. And so what does he do? We know this. We study the book of Exodus. We've read it. God, through a series of plagues, unleashes his power 
against Pharaoh and against each of those plagues as we have seen against these false gods of Egypt. Each one an attack and an assault against them. And finally the Lord attacks and humbles Pharaoh and leads his people out, delivers them from bondage, slavery, and captivity, takes them across the Red Sea, swallows up Pharaoh's army, gives them manna in the wilderness, gives them his presence, gives them his tabernacle, gives them the Ark of the Covenant, finally gives them Canaan, blessing upon blessing upon blessing, though they are undeserving. And he's reminding his people of that here. So this past Monday, most of us celebrated Independence Day in some form or fashion. Maybe just with a long nap, maybe with some good food and drinks, maybe with some friends and family, but we celebrated it. And I would argue probably most of us celebrated Independence Day with very little idea or remembrance of what went down 250 years ago in the revolution. And we may have testified to it momentarily in conversation or seen something online, some social media reference, but without thinking about those battles of Bunker Hill and Lexington and Concord, thinking about the lives lost and the sacrifices made in the revolution so that the declaration of independence can stand as true for us. And so while we enjoy the benefits of freedom in this country, oftentimes, probably most of us, don't really give credence to that which procured that freedom. And that's what the Israelites were doing here in the eighth century. God is taking them back more than twice as long as we have been a nation, 500 years prior, the Lord had delivered his people from Egypt. And yet, while they're enjoying the benefits of Canaan and God's provision for them, they have forgotten how God has, by his power, delivered them. And so he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. So the more that I pursue them, that's the picture here. When they were a child, I loved them. I showered them with my affection. And the more that they ran away, the more I continued to pursue them. And they kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. So on Monday, I spent the entire day with my family um, specifically my kids, just trying to make them happy. Just trying to show them, hopefully, how much I love them. And so we get up in the morning and I get them breakfast and then we prepare for this big party. And in case you don't know me really well, I am not a big party person. It's just not me. Um, but my kids love parties. So I'm like, all right. And my friends love parties, apparently. So I was like, all right, we'll have some friends over and my kids will have fun. It'll just be a great day. And so they come over, friends come over and Tons of people out in the backyard and in the pool and we're celebrating Independence Day and we're eating some good food. And then um, during the course of that party, some of the kids, my friend's kids, decide they want to inform my children that they're shooting off fireworks in their neighborhood around the corner after dark that evening. Okay, which you might be like, oh, that sounds fun, but that's probably because you don't have children. Because when the sun goes down, I like for my kids, I love my kids when the sun is up most of the time. <laughs> But when the sun goes down, I like my books and I like quiet and I like peace. I don't like fireworks and wondering if my children will run out in the street. And so these depraved children of my friends decide to tell my children that they're doing fireworks. So my oldest two, Spurgeon who's eight and Evie who's almost six, keep begging me all day, can we please go see the fireworks? Please, 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 our lives depend upon this. And so um, that evening, I asked my friends, hey, when exactly are you going to fire off the fireworks? Because you know how people are. They'll be like, show up at seven. And like four hours later, they fire off fireworks. And so that's not me. I don't want to sit there for four hours. So I'm like, when exactly? And so I show up. I love my friends. But like 45 minutes later, the fireworks finally go off. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Evie and Spurgeon get out of the car. And Tabby's like, hey, there's some sprinkl um, those sparklers over here. Uh, and they're like, can we get a sparkler? And I'm like, Sure. So Spurgeon, I took the pictures. I don't have them up on the screens, and apparently the screens aren't working anyway. And so, um, but, but in one picture, you have Spurgeon there, and he is holding the, the sparkler out away from his body with the, I would say, appropriate amount of caution upon his face that this is fire. 
okay? And in the other picture, you have my daughter, and you don't know her as well as I do, but when I look at that picture, I just see um, the, the flame swallowing circus act like that she wants to enact here with this, with this sparkler. You can see it in her eyes, like, I want to get closer to this thing. And so I'm like, Evie, please, in the moment, I'm like, Evie, please don't touch that, okay? Just let it do its thing and just watch it. How about that? Instead of touching it, she's like, yes, daddy. And so she obeys right up until it goes out, and then she decides she wants to wrap her hand around it. I know, all right? Um, so, burned fingers. And in that moment, I mean, it's been a long day. And it's right after Sunday, which is already a long day. And so I'm like, baby girl, are you serious? Like, I have literally spent all day just serving you, just loving you and caring for you and whatever you want. I mean, here it is after dark, two hours after bedtime, and I'm just trying to take care of you. And you can't follow this simple instruction. Now, you could be like, well, that's, that's impatient of you. And maybe I wasn't that angry. Hopefully I wasn't. But I was frustrated in that moment. And that's kind of what we feel here where the Lord is saying, um, when you were a child, I pursued you and I loved you. I set my affection upon you. I blessed you. I rescued you from Egypt. But the more that I kept coming after you, the more that I relentlessly pursued you, the more that I demonstrated my love for you, the more you just kept running after your idols and grieving my heart. They kept sacrificing to the bells and burning offerings to idols. Verse three, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. So when you hear verse two, like they kept running after the bells, they kept running after idols. Um, you're thinking to yourself, all right, here comes the judgment thing again. Because it's Hosea. God's like, I'm, I'm a, there's going to be payback for this. There's going to be discipline for this. And instead it's, I was the one who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms. When we as parents, so here's the picture. When we as parents teach our children to walk, we don't lift them up to our level, but we condescend to their level. That's the idea here. I stooped shouldered humility. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed him. The entire passage here just drips with the compassionate heart of the Father. And he's looking at the nation of Israel, and he's looking at us by grace, and he's saying, you are my kids, and I have loved you. And I am the one who taught you to walk, and I am the one who has healed your sp primarily spiritual infirmities here. They don't even know that. They don't even realize that. I've talked about it before, but Evie is my only biological kid. And so she was the only one that I was actually in the hospital room when uh, she was born of my three kids. And I remember being there, and it was a pretty traumatic experience for me, if I'm honest, um, and for my wife. And uh, she, was, uh, she was in pain, and then she wasn't in pain anymore because they make this medicine that apparently works. And so then she's, like, trying to give birth to our baby, and the doctor finally comes and is like, oh, the baby is about to arrive. Your little girl's about to arrive. You want to come down here and catch her? And as I've told you, I'm like, no. <laughs> you literally went to medical school. Like, you catch her. <laughs> Um, and, and then so she catches her and pulls her out and then there's that umbilical cord and she's like, do you want to cut the umbilical cord? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I have no training re related to this. Um, why don't you do that? You're a doctor. And my wife's like kind of, kind of reviving herself. She's like, I'll cut it. And I'm like, good for you. And so she cuts the umbilical cord and then there's Evie, my, my, my little girl, eight pounds, six ounces and little Evie's right there. And in that moment, and you get this, if you're a parent, grandparent, like you get this, even if you're not a parent, you can understand this. Like there is like this enormous, inexplicable depth and breadth of love for that little person that you didn't even know you were capable of. People have talked about it. Before you have kids, they'll be like, oh, you don't, you're not gonna understand that until you have children. And then you have children, and you're like, this is love beyond compare. But that's because they're my kids. So my kids. This last week, one of the young couples in our church, love them. They're awesome. Uh, the wife left town, go on a business trip. The husband, I don't know if he's here this morning, but shout out to you, Todd. But the husband put up their, their newest little baby, four or five weeks old. Super cute, 
chubby, all the rolls and everything going on. And his caption on Instagram was pure cuteness. And in that moment, that's not my kid. So I just, all I could think was pure depravity. Like looking at this little baby, all cute and everything. And I wanted to be like, I wanted to message him and be like, hey, Todd, you know, like pure cuteness and everything. I, that's, that's great. Um, but reality is when that baby gets hungry, if he had the strength, he would rip your arms off and beat you to death with them. Like that's the level of the depth of depravity that's there in that little kid, right? Let me all understand that. God doesn't make them omnipotent because they would kill us as children. And they kind of grow up and they learn, okay, I, I, should, I should behave. We, we're going to hide our depravity. We're going to it a little bit, okay? Like that's the reality. So when I, when I look at this, I'm going, okay, it's easy for us potentially to look at this and say, all right, when it comes to my children, I kind of understand what God is saying here. But when it comes to other children, remember this is poetry, and so what he's doing is he's bringing this before their minds. And he's saying, okay, look, and in one sense, we understand mercy and compassion and cuteness when it comes to our kids. But I'm just speaking of children in general here. And I'm saying that when you were like children, when you were rebels, when you did not submit to me, when you did not pledge allegiance to me, when you did not obey me, I taught you to walk. I took him up by the arms. I led them with cords of kindness and with bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. When, when the animal in the field and the society obeys and is submissive, they can ease the yoke, ease the bridle. They'll plow the line straight. And so he says, they understood that and they submitted to me in these moments. And I bent down to them and fed them. Verse number five, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king. So he's been saying in the previous passages, okay, you, you might end up going back to Egypt. Uh, he's speaking about their former captivity, but now he clarifies and he says, you're not actually going back to Egypt. You're just gonna enter into a captivity similar to what you experienced in Egypt. Assyria is going to rule over you. It's going to be the Assyrian king. Because they have refused to return to me, so the head here for a second, to stay consistent with the analogy earlier, the head plunges below the surface again. It's a little dark here. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own culture, right? Or because of their own governments. That's not what it says here. As much as we want to blame all of our, you know, those in our culture and those even in our churches and those around us and our husbands and our wives and those who have influence over us, he says, the sword will rage, consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own counsels. So Tim Batelli just moved back to the area, one of my friends, and he was a pastor here years ago and he, they just moved back, started coming here to Building 28, so we went to lunch this Thursday. And we were talking about, they moved away six years ago. So it was like five lifetimes, like six years ago. The world was seemingly a very different place. And so I'm saying to them, hey, you know what, Tim? Um, we're talking about the changes both in the culture and in the city and even in church. And he said, you know, with, when postmodernism hit, and postmodernism was this very popular ideology in the late 90s, early 2000s, essentially disbanding belief in absolutes. There's no absolute good or evil, right or wrong. And so he said, when postmodernism hit, I thought to myself, you know, this has to be the end of society and culture and civilization as we know it. Like, what could possibly come next? But then he goes, we're seeing something totally different now. And I said, yeah, what, what I've seen is on the heels of this postmodernism is what we could just call a personal Gnosticism. Meaning, so Gnosticism is this idea from experience and from feeling that I can establish and kind of create my own truth according to my counsel. And we see this, right? Maybe you don't see it as clearly, but I see it everywhere where, like, I just asked you this morning, when, like, let's, okay, this is an example. When your wife annoys you, if you're, if you're married. If you're not married, you're like, wives annoy? No, like, okay, when your husband annoy you, annoys you, okay, ladies? Um, when your spouse annoys you, uh, who gives you the counsel to get frustrated and angry and lash out at them and say mean things? Who, who gives? I don't even know. Like, I know a lot of stupid people, right? Like, I know a lot, a lot of ungodly people. I don't know anybody who'd be like, hey, when Danielle annoys you, what you ought to do is get impatient with her and get angry. 
I don't know anybody who's gonna give me that counsel except for my own heart. Like my own soul, your own soul. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying you did according to what you thought was right, what you ultimately wanted because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me and though they call out to the most high. And that seems nice, right? They're calling out to Jesus. Well, that's not true. This is not the name El Shaddai here, God Almighty. It's rather the name El Al, which is a derivative of Elohim mixed with Baal, the Canaanite God. So they're coming to him and they're saying, um, we worship you, you're the great one, you're the almighty one, but really they're finding equal worship and security and comfort and affluence in the gods of Canaan. And he says, though they call out to the most high, El all, he shall not raise them up at all. Okay, so we take a deep breath here because you would imagine once again in consistency with the book of Hosea that judgment's coming, but he says, verse eight, but how can I give you up, O Ephraim? So once again, here's the picture. It's kind of transferred from a loving husband to an unfaithful wife to now a loving husband to a rebellious wayward child. Loving father, a rebellious wayward child. And he's saying here, you're bent on running away from me. Your heart is inclined not to worship me. But how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Admon? How can I treat you like Zeboim? So you're like, who, what are, who are these two people, or these two cities? Well, they're the cities, kind of the suburbs surrounding the major cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 14. They're not as well known. Why? Well, because I, I the commentators kind of differ on this, but I tend to believe they're, the reason why the Lord uses them here instead of Sodom and Gomorrah is because the people in this portion of history and this portion of scripture have kind of justified their sin and said, we're not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. That we're not outwardly treacherous. And so instead of bringing up Sodom and Gomorrah, he brings up these surrounding less known cities and says, this is where you're heading. Punishment and destruction. And yet there's something in his heart now. I'm guessing the screens are just gone. Okay, so I had a couple of quotes up here that I think really would help us, but apparently the Lord doesn't think they would help you that much because he turned the screens off, okay? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna, try, to, I'm gonna try to remember them this morning, okay? So we believe God's sovereign, so this is part of his plan, not mine. Um, but one commentator this week was saying, now it might be easy to come to this passage, this verse, and say, and say, well, this doesn't make any sense, Hosea, because God is impassable. He doesn't have passions. He's immutable. He doesn't change. And so when you're reading this verse here, it sounds like there's kind of this dilemma in the heart of God. Like, what am I, like, I know what I should do. I should do the right thing. There should be punishment, but how can I punish you? How can I let you go? And the commentator said, what we need to do is we need to shelf this, this, these theological uh, understandings, which are true, and not miss out here that the Lord is communicating to us in human language the angst of his own heart, the grief of his own heart in looking at his wayward children. And he says to them, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? How can I make you like Sodom? How can I treat you like Gomorrah? My heart literally, this way he says to us while we understand Immutability, he doesn't really, it doesn't really recoil. His heart doesn't change. It's not breaking down like ours is, but his heart recoils within him at this thoughts. And my compassion grows warm and tender. We were at Chick-fil-A years ago, probably 2019 now, and I had my three kids. We were in the little play place on Gulf to Bay and they're playing. And this lady comes in with four children and she sits down on the bench there and you can just kind of tell she wasn't the mom. She's maybe the babysitter or taking care of them. And these four children start to play. And they're all like probably three to nine years old. And they're playing. They're playing pretty nice. They're playing with my kids. And then the oldest of the boys, probably nine years old, comes walking over to the lady and says, when is he going to be here? And she goes, he said he'd be here. Like he's just running late, I'm sure. And so he goes back to playing. A few minutes later, he comes back. And he's like, but, but is he coming? And when is he going to be here? And 
The lady tries to console him and assure him. He goes back to playing. So I just look over and we start talking. I find out these four children are foster kids. And she is their worker. And she's waiting on the dad to show up who hasn't seen his kids in weeks. And they're so hopeful that he'll arrive and so desperate for this parental influence and this parental love that's just missing. And in that moment, okay, like I'm a, you probably guess this even if you don't know me, I'm, I'm a rather kind of cold, analytical individual when it comes to stuff. But there was something that happened inside of me. We have two adopted kids of our own. And so when I see this and I hear this going down and I see the sorrow on these little kids' faces, I just call my wife and I'm like, hey, you want four more? <laughs> she's like, what's going on? I tell her and she's like, Sure. And so I start talking to a lady, and there's this process, and obviously by God's providence, it didn't work out for us. But in that moment, I could begin to relate, begin to understand. And we've all had moments like that where we can begin to understand what the Lord, in a way here, according to our vernacular, is feeling. My heart recoils within me at the idea of judgment or even punishments, consequence. My compassion grows warm and tender. Now, this would be pretty scandalous and radical as it stands, but especially in light of the previous 10 chapters. Like, it is completely stunning. Verse number nine. I will not execute my burning anger. Now, what, what do we understand? We're gonna see this more next week. But Assyria invades. God chastises his people, corrects his people, to restore his people. But he says here, I will not execute my burning anger against their sin. I will not again destroy Ephraim. That's another name for Israel. Basically the idea here is ultimate or total or final destruction. I will not do that. And I know at this point you're going, now they're very different. This, this whole idea of weak need, um, tenderness that we kind of call love in our society today where, oh God, you can't really hold them accountable, that you can't really um, prescribe ultimate consequence to them. That's really American, kind of Western and modern. So really the people here are most likely saying, these people deserve punishment. I mean, the religious people be reading this, they're like, these people deserve wrath. And the Lord says, no, no, no. I will not execute my ultimate anger. I will not finally destroy Ephraim for I am God and not man. I'm not like you guys. I'm not like, you're just saying this because you're so prone to passion. I'm not prone to, I don't receive new information. I don't react negatively. I don't have regrets. That's not me. I am God, not a man, the holy one, the perfect one. What I do is right is in your midst. And I will not come in ultimate wrath against my people. Verse 10. They shall go after the Lord. This is what's going to happen. They're going to go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his people shall run trembling. No, when he roars, his people shall come trembling back from the west. And they shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. Now, Judah only does this in part because we're about to see in chapter 12 that Judah has their own set of issues as well. But the Lord here is coming to the end of this passage and he's saying, uh, here's, here's the tenor, just in case we're, we need to all land on the same page. The, the tone here is, Israel's full of deceit, Israel keeps lying, their, their hearts are running after fraudulent worship. These are my people. This is what they're guilty of. And yet, how can I give you up? How can I turn you over? I will not ultimately condemn my people. Now, we'll continue on next week. We just have two weeks left in the book of Hosea. But for this morning, the themes that really emerge from this text are twofold. Number one, the first thing that I think we see very clearly we need to feel this though as well, is the radical reality of the unconditional love of God for his people. Like unconditional. On the fourth, 
Kids are all in the pool. There's like 20 kids at our house swimming around. My youngest, Augustine, is three. He just learned to swim a few weeks ago. He's doing a great job. His, his freestyle is, is down pat. And so I'm watching him pretty closely. He jumps in the pool four or five times, swims all the way across the pool. I'm like, all right, he's good to go. I turn my back for one second. He jumps in the pool, gets halfway across and freezes up. Like, um, starts freaking out a little bit, starts slobbering and crying. And so Jason, when my friend sees him, is like, oh my gosh, and jumps into the pool and pulls him to the side and pulls him out. And I'm like, thanks, buddy. And I pat him on the back. There wasn't like a high level of exuberance or adoration or praise for Jason from me. And the reason why is because I honestly, I mean, I knew he was struggling a little bit. I don't, I think he would have made it. He would have been fine. Like, I really do. Like, I, I, like he's, trying, he's trying to just freaking out there because there's so many kids around him, but his legs were still churning. He was only three feet from the edge. He's going to make it. He's going to be all right. He wasn't in such desperate need that he needed a, uh, the radical display of salvation that Jason bestowed upon him. He just didn't need that. I think that, I think that my heart, maybe your heart oftentimes, is not filled to overflowing with the radical gratitude that we should display because Christians in America in the 21st century have been acclimated to believe that salvation of God was not that radical because our plight was not that desperate. Like we didn't really, like, okay, God, good job. Really appreciate that whole thing with the cross and the, re- the empty tomb, but um, I, wasn't, I didn't really need it. I'm not that bad of a person. Like, um, recently, I guess a couple months ago, I found some pictures. They were pictures I had taken like three years ago when I decided to get in shape. The, the, the before pictures, okay? In case you're wondering. The before pictures. So when you take the before pictures, um, you, just, you just kind of stand there in your shorts, your gym shorts, um, and you just let everything hang out and you're just like, oh, look at me, like I'm disgusting, I'm revolting, like this is gross. And, um, but you're doing that because you're like, in, in, in a few months, I'm gonna look amazing. I'm gonna look amazing. And I, so I remember taking those pictures and working out for like uh, three days. And, and then I found those pictures and I'm like, oh my gosh, I look worse now than I did three years ago. Like, this is terrible. Like the, the after pictures are worse than the before pictures. And you're like, where the heck is this going? So, dude, it's, it's so gross. It's just so disgusting, okay? So we should just stop this kind of stuff. Yes, those pictures are, but I'm not talking about something else. We should stop measuring the security of our salvation on how we look today versus how we looked yesterday. We should stop all that. This is nonsense. That's what other religions do. That's what all the philosophers of the world will point you toward. Like your security is not safe because you look the part today or you can fake the part well. Like your, your security, my security is fixed in Christ even, because here's the thing, like hopefully there has been faithfulness and perseverance and the mortification of sin and all that stuff where we are stronger today. But for some of us, we're like, hey man, I'm doing really well today and you could completely collapse tomorrow. And if your security is based on, man, I've persevered. I'm obeying well, I'm strong in the faith. What happens to your security tomorrow? What happens there? I'm secure, you're secure because the almighty God, El Shaddai, has stepped into the equation and has said, I refuse to stop loving you. I refuse that. I will continue to love my people, my children, who by the graciousness of Christ have trusted in him. We have trusted in him by his graciousness to us. And he loves us. He loves you. He looks at us and says, when you were a child, when you were full of rebellion, radical sin, before you could, Romans 9, choose right and wrong, good and evil. I loved you. I set my grace upon you. Um, Some of us this morning need to be rocked by this reality. I was reading Mere Christianity earlier this year. Came across, there's several texts in here that are awesome. Mere Christianity, book written 80 years ago by C.S. Lewis. And just one little portion, I just wanna lay it before you guys, just for our consideration. He says this, when a man is getting better, and when we we talk about getting better, we're talking about maturation. When we're kind of growing up, especially in Christ and in the faith, and we're learning, our hearts softening to the gospel. So that's the, the idea here. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. Did you catch that? So the more we become like Jesus and the closer we grow in our relationship to the Lord, the more we're aware of the depravity that still remains in our hearts. The sun 
illuminates sin. So the closer we grow to the sun, as the Puritans would say, the more our sin comes into focus. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he is not very good. But a thoroughly bad man thinks he is all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake, not while you are sleeping. You can see mistakes in arithmetic when your mind is working properly. While you are making those mistakes, you can't see them. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you are sober, not when you are drunk. Good people, those once again submitted to the Lord, walking with the Lord, we're not talking about moralistic theology, we're talking about those who have accepted Christ and are growing. We can understand, we know about both good and evil. Those who are rebellious do not know about either. And so if the tendency here is to sit here this morning and be like, I'm uh, like, I know I made some mistakes here and there, but I'm not that bad. Like what we need to do is we need to understand because in understanding, like it's not that hard to love the four little kids at Chick-fil-A because they're cute and they're playing nice with my kids. So it's easy for us to be like, I'm like one of those little kids. When the Lord says, when you were a child, I loved you. I'm like one of the kids at Chick-fil-A. I'm cute and yeah, I made some mistakes. No, like we're, that's not us. The Lord's tenderness and his compassion is deeper than we can imagine because we're rebels and we're sinister and we're fallen. And in, in maturity, as we grow up, we begin to see that more and more clearly. We need to be reminded of that. And so what we're hit with here this morning is while we see our sin in the first 10 chapters, we see the radical reality of God's unconditional love for us as people. Like I taught you to walk. I lifted you up. I will stay with you. My heart of compassion burns for you. My, my heart recoils when I think of punishments. And then secondly, a second thing that's very clear here is the remarkable manifestation or manifestations of the unconditional love of God. Like we, we hear hints and catch glimpses here. Like when he says, out of Egypt, I called my son. And almost every commentator on Hosea draws a direct line to the gospel of Matthew where the son of God comes up out of Egypt in order to alleviate the slavery and captivity of his people, ultimately, and grant them rescue and grant them salvation, or they shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. So we catch glimpses here of the lion of the tribe of Judah that we see in Revelation chapter five, the one who roars and rallies back his people to himself. J.I. Packer, this is another quote I have on screen, so I'll probably butcher it, I apologize. But J.I. Packer passed away a couple years ago one of my favorite theologians said this, there is this immense comfort in the reality that the love of God at every point is associated with the depth of his knowledge of exactly how wicked I am. Like, so don't miss that. Like at every point, we do a good job of parading our spirituality and pretending like we're not that bad so we can deceive other people, maybe even our own hearts but the Lord knows exactly our motivations, exactly our thoughts, exactly our narcissistic tendencies, exactly our pride, our lust. And yet at every point, he refuses to stop loving us. And he demonstrates the depth of his unconditional love for us in the person and the work of Christ Jesus. And we talk here a lot about the cross and we should. And we talk here a lot about the empty tomb and the blood work, the atoning work of Christ. But the reality for us is that that's, that's past for most of us here, we've trusted in Jesus. And so that's past. Like that's, there was a moment a year ago or 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, where we trusted in Christ. What does it mean for us today? I've been reading this, another book by C.S. Lewis, going through the Chronicles of Narnia. You're probably familiar with them from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian. But there's seven of these books. And so I'm reading it to my oldest two children right now. We just finished this book, The Horse and His Boy, not very well known. Uh, takes place after The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And so what I want to do is just kind of, as we wrap down, prepare our hearts for communion this morning, um, here's the deal. I want to just lay this story before you so we can begin to understand the manifestations, what the Lord is saying here in Hosea chapter 11. So the story of the horse and this boy, really quick, is the story of this little boy Shasta who's an orphan who washes up on the banks of 
um, of a country to the south of Narnia. If you're familiar, Narnia is this country to the north, kind of like Middle Earth of sorts, like this magical country. And Aslan is the king. Aslan is the lion who is descriptive of Jesus. We see him in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Death on the Stone Table, Resurrection, Emancipation for his people. So Shasta, this little orphan boy, washes up as a baby on the shores of a foreign country, is taken in by a farmer who's really a tyrant, mistreats him. Shasta grows up, and still as a little boy, he encounters a talking horse, okay, from Narnia. The talking horse's name is Bree. And Bree says, I used to live in Narnia. Let's try to escape together from our rulers, from these tyrants, and go back to Narnia. And so Shasta learns to ride on the back of Bree, and they set off on this perilous adventure together. And there are many fears that come their way, many things that face them. And one of those is in the depth of night when they cannot see around them, they hear a rider to their left. And they're like, man, what if that rider's coming after us? We need to get away from them. So they try to steer away from this rider. And yet then on their right, they hear the growls and the roars of a lion. And so this lion pushes them closer to the rider. They end up merging with the rider and another horse. And it turns out to be another talking horse from Narnia and a, and a little girl on top. And they become friends. And they become, become companions here. And the little girl says, we also heard a lion, another lion roaring on our left. So it drove us to you. So then they make their way to the city of Tashbe, this wicked city in, in, the, in the country in which they're staying. And Shasta makes his way. They get separated. He makes his way out of the city. He's there at the tombs and he's waiting to be reunited with his friends. And he hears the jackals calling at night and there's all kinds of fears around him. But then he hears again the roar of a great lion. He's so terrified, but he finally slips off to sleep and he wakes up in the morning and he's safe. And now he's re reunited with the two horses and his friend Erebus, this little girl. And they make their way across the desert. And just as they're running out of energy, they look behind them and they see the prince of Tashban and his army's coming to besiege the cities of Narnia. And so they're racing for their lives. They're out of strength. The horses say, we can't go any further. And all of a sudden they hear the more the roar of a lion behind them, right on their heels. And with a newfound courage, they race for safety. And the two horses and the little girl are exhausted. So Shasta, this little boy continues on his way. And once again, he's in the dead of night, racing to warn the, the castles and the cities of this army that's approaching. And he hears a voice on his left in the dark. He hears breathing first and then he hears a voice. And the voice begins to speak to him. And I'm just gonna read this to you really quick, kind of catch you up. He's going to warn, he's exhausted, he's overwhelmed, he's terrified. And the voice said, I'm not here to harm you. Set your sorrows aside. And so Shasta, it says this, Shasta was a little reassured by the breath beside him now from this voice in the dark. So Shasta told how he had never known his real father and mother and had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and of all their dangers in Tashban and about his night among the tombs and how the beast howled at him out of the desert. And he told about the heat and the thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus. That's the little girl he's friends with. And also how very long it was since he had eaten anything. The large voice said beside him, I do not call you unfortunate. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, said Shasta? There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the very first night and there was only one, but he was very swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus, the little girl, to forge a friendship. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that they should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at night to retrieve you. Who are you, said Shasta. And the voice responded, myself, very deep and low, so the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear and happy. And the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it at all. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as the leaves rustled with it. And Shasta was no longer afraid that the voice belonged to something that would eat him. 
nor that it was the voice of a ghost, but a new and different sort of trembling came over him, yet he felt glad to. And it finishes the passage with the sun coming up and him seeing Aslan beside him, the lion who had pushed the boat to shore, the lion who had protected him on the journey, the lion who had even caused pain in order to engender courage among his people. And it says this, upon seeing the lion, no one ever saw anything more terrible or beautiful. I love the way that Lewis captures this because the reality that he's getting after here is even when we don't understand, and there's so much in this life that we don't understand, even when we don't get it, the Lord looks at us and he says, even when your faith is weak, even when it feels that your soul for my people has forsaken me, I will not forsake you. I refuse to stop loving you. I refuse to stop pouring graciousness upon you. I will continue to lead you. I will not lead to ultimate destruction for you, my people. Even when you forget me, I will not forget you. My love is for you. And it's manifested for us, yes, in the cross of Christ and him taking our sin upon himself in the blood of Christ and him shedding that blood for us, but in the reality that here and now he will not forsake, he will never leave. He is with us, his people, securing and protecting us to the end, the radical manifestation of the unconditional love of God for us. And so we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna take communion. This is a time for believers, for those who have trusted in Jesus once again. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we do in this time is we meditate on the truth that we've heard and we confess that truth and we confess our sins and we give thanks for the radical, remarkable demonstrations of God's love, the depth of his love, covenantal, unconditional love for us.